Hello, my name is Claire Skinner. I'm the regional leader of Hydrogen Struggles in Europe. I'm a partner in our global industrial and CEO and board practices. Today, we're joined by Niall Mills, the managing partner and global head of infrastructure for Igneo Infrastructure, which is a global asset management group with $15 billion under management and providing active specialist investments around the world. Prior to joining Igneo, Niall held a number of senior roles in the industry, including Southern Water, Honeywell, Bechtel, and United Utilities. He currently sits on the board of investee companies, including UK Water Utility Anglian Water Group, a Finnish electricity group called Karuna, and an Estonian district heating group, Utilitas. Niall, welcome, and thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, tell us a little bit about Igneo and your uh, the group's journey on net zero and how you're thinking about it. If I start with Igneo, uh, we are a um, an asset manager, a specialist infrastructure manager, um, and as you rightly said in your in your brief intro, we're we're very proactive and, and engaged with the business we invest in, uh, and we manage by really getting into the businesses and forming a tight partnership with the management teams in the in the assets that we invest in um, and ideally adding some value and one of the things that I, I often say to to my colleagues when we uh, either acquire a new business or somebody's maybe joining a board for the first time is that you have to bring something to the board table uh, a, a board uh, role is a responsibility not an entitlement you have to come with ideas, you have to engage with the management team, you have to recognise that quite often you'll be working with people who are specialists and have many, many years, if not decades of experience uh, in the business that you're uh, investing in. So they've got an awful lot to contribute. And um, In terms of uh, net zero, um, we as a fund have made a commitment to be net zero by 2050. Um, we will achieve that much earlier uh, in many of the businesses that we're invested in. For example, in Anglian Water, we hope to achieve that in the next decade. Um, in our wind portfolio in, in Portugal, we're net zero already. But in, in other you know, heavy industry businesses, um, that will take longer. Hence, uh, uh, what I would say is a relatively unambitious target of 2050. Um, so we'll, we're going to work very hard to bring that forward. The reason we haven't said something like 2040 or 2035 is um, we're not going to make sweeping statements and commitments like that until we actually know we can achieve it. Um, so we're actually working very closely with all of the businesses in the portfolio to have a tangible and realistic plan about what are we going to do to make sure we can get to net zero. And then you'll see that target coming in closer. But in terms of um, how does that align with Igneo as a business, it's an absolute fundamental. Um, it's a responsibility from all of us as individuals. I actually believe it starts at home. I think the net zero journey is the way we behave with our families and our friends. Um, but as a business and a, and a big investor with a big responsibility to our customers, our clients, the community, um, then it, it's an imperative. Can we start first at a platform level? When you're thinking about the trends in the industry around ESG broadly, but also around net zero, what are your investors asking you to do? And then how does that ref reflect on the people you recruit and develop onto your platform? We, as in you know, the, the asset manager, the people that we're, are entrusted with the stewardship of, of, of other people's assets, are hands-on and get it done. We do not outsource ESG or responsible investment to statistical consultants. We want to do it ourselves. We want to learn. We don't get everything right, but we want to work with management teams and really get under the skin of delivering that. And that's, you know, that's absolutely where the sector is today. It's an expectation requirement. If... If we weren't doing it, if we couldn't show that we were doing it, if we couldn't show that year on year we'd improved, um, our staff would go somewhere else. The, the culture wouldn't be right. Uh, and that's where attracting talent is about culture. It is about uh, providing a place where people want to work, where they feel valued, where they enjoy it. Um, you know, and I'm, one of the things I'm very proud of, as you know, is um, we, we've got no private offices. We're, we're a completely open plan uh, team. We move the desks around. We want people to sit with different people and get to know the team really well. Um, we don't believe in, in in status from desks. We want we want to be open, listen to what's going on. I've, I've always said that you shouldn't be having any kind of conversations that that you can't uh, that you wouldn't be comfortable sharing with your colleagues or, or them listening to. If you need to make a personal phone call, 
plenty of rooms and plenty of offices to go and do that. But in terms of talking about the business, I want the whole team to hear what's going on. And, and I want them to understand where there are challenges within businesses, where things are going well. I want them to hear language about um, reporting, about new requirements. So we're all improving our knowledge all the time. The two things that are most important about somebody's career are the quality of the people that you're working with, and that's both personality, culture, ability, and variety. And we're really, really lucky in Igneo. You know, everybody in the team is involved in client engagements, everybody's involved in transactions, everybody's involved in reporting in ESG and in helping manage the portfolio assets. Now, as an investor, what, what do you expect your boards to do to drive net zero, to be ambitious, to, to really push this through? And what are the trade-offs that you are discussing on the board as you think that through? So how do we approach it? Well, we spend a, a lot of time uh, trying to find the right people for those boards, the right leadership teams. Uh, we're looking for individuals who have an appetite for change, who have experiences to bring, to challenge, to support. Um, we're looking for people who have plenty of hunger and ambition. Um, uh, and, and thankfully, you know, there are many, many people out there that have all of those uh, qualities. Uh, we're looking for diversity of thought um, in everything else. And then we, we get down to some, some simple basics. So uh, at acquisition for uh, post acquisition of, of a new business, um, we look to set up a really good governance structure. And obviously we comply with UK corporate governance code in every regard, but we also try and enhance that a little bit. So uh, we will have a formal safety committee reporting to the board that has the same status as the audit committee and the remuneration committee and nominations. Um, because quite frankly, health and safety is just as important as remuneration, if not more so. So we'll do that. And then we have uh, five minimum standards that we look to implement. And, and I won't bore you with all of that, but it's, it's, it's much of what you expect. Now, within those five minimum standards, there's a lot of detail. And quite often, we're lucky that there's a little bit of low-hanging fruit. So it may be that the business doesn't do uh, annual customer satisfaction service. Just picking a simple example. So we implement that quickly. Um, so you can normally achieve a few things quite quickly that sends very strong signals to the organization that you're deadly serious about customer service, you're really serious about environment protection. So we do that. Then, of course, you're into the, the longer haul of um, uh, trying to make long-term improvements because that you know you will run out of easy fixes in your first 12 months when you should do because the easy stuff should be addressed quickly. And the longer haul stuff is about defining the strategy that will decarbonize the business, defining the strategy that will... And improve customer service to enable you to have your customers there in a very sustainable way so that all the good things you're doing to, for example, decarbonize uh, are, of course, being recognized and being used by your customers and you're growing the business. And I, and I, I say, um, we, I mean, with enormous pride, we, we're, not, we're not shy at all of putting a lot of investment into businesses to make that happen. Um, and I mean hundreds of millions um, in, in in Karuna, for example, we invest at 1.5 billion euros over six years to weatherproof the network, to push cables underground. Um, in Infinium in the UK, the, 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 the business where you know, you've, you've helped us build an outstanding board of leadership team, um, we're investing hundreds of millions in new energy from waste plants using the best technology on the planet. And that's avoiding, you know, it's sim simple stuff. That's avoiding landfill, okay? We've all driven past landfill with the thousands of seagulls over, overhead, destroying the countryside, you know, just creating this long-term pollution issue. It, it's not sustainable. It can't go on. So energy from waste from us is that's that's the way we turn that waste into energy, sell it back into the grid, but it's also avoiding the damage of landfill and, and the production of methane that comes from those sites as well. So there's a really strong um, ethical side to what we're doing. Um, and that's a great way to engage with customers. It's a great way to engage with employees. Um, another example, uh, Scandlines, ferry business from Denmark to Germany. Uh, during the pandemic, when we were cutting costs and really con concerned about uh, customer traffic, we ordered uh, a brand new fully electric ferry, 80 million euros, um, biggest in the world, um, because we were never going to stop decarbonizing the business, electrifying the fleet, just because of the pandemic. We knew it could come out of it. We knew we had to do it and replace that order. Um, so, you know, again, signaling to the business that even though 
Um, we were in the middle of a pandemic, you know, revenues had dropped, people weren't traveling for obvious reasons. Uh, it wasn't going to stop our commitment to doing the right thing for the business. And that's a great example of a business that has come out of the pandemic much, much stronger. If you look forward across the portfolio and also the investments you're likely to make in yep. your funds, are you going to, do you think you are going to change the profile of the talent that you look to bring into either the executive or the board in net zero and um, taking net zero into account or do you think it's going to be more of the same do you think there's going to be particular skill sets that you're going to want around the table i, I think we have to challenge ourselves to bring in better and more creative and contemporary talent um so i, I, I love working with I, I love working with real people okay um and I, I want to work with people who are, who are honest and direct and, and show you their emotion um, and that they care. Um, and that's really exciting for me. And I, you know, I want, I want people to feel that they can be authentic um, and emotional in business because it is important and it makes such an enormous difference. I want the same in executive committees and the same in the boards. Now, I'll, there's, I'll, I'll qualify that and say that, of course, there's an element of professionalism that we have to make at all time there are standards but i want that real energy to come out um, and people to feel that they can share ideas and bring ideas ideas to the table so that so that absolutely takes you on a journey that is moving from you know boards 20 years ago which were all about governance mm -hmm. it was all about um you know it was all about so what's keeping you awake at night um or um, is there anything you haven't told us yet that kind of stuff I, that, that that just doesn't wash anymore you know you, you want people who can engage and say, um, there's a bit of innovation going on in another company I'm involved in. Do you think it'd be useful to discuss that? Because I'm very happy to make an introduction because I think that may, might be very additive to your strategy for whatever it might be, electrification or, or um, you know, remote monitoring or whatever it might be. You know, so innovation sits absolutely hand in hand with decarbonizing, with low carbon, with ESG. But th that's, that's like training for, you know, it's like athletes training for the Olympics. They spend years and years training for that one event. It's the same for something like innovation and tech. It takes years and years to get there. But standing in that podium, picking up the medals later on is like delivering your business success five years down the line. It's, it's you know, highly engaging and motivating. Um, so I love that. I mean, I'll give you like, a little anecdote, Claire. I, I, um, so I, I went to visit one of these technology companies uh, and they absolutely blew my mind with innovation. Blew my mind. And at the end of the day, I was in back in the hotel with the, uh, the, the chief engineer, um, head of innovation in this particular business. Uh, he was not one of our advisors, of course, because when you meet good people, keep them. <laughs> don't, let somebody, don't, don't let somebody else take them. <laughs> um, so so this, 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 this gentleman was with me. He was working for the portfolio company at the time. He's not one of, one of our advisors and a personal friend. And I said to him uh, that evening in, in the bar, I said, that's oh, a great idea. You know, this, this is really going to transform this company. Really enjoyed it. What about this? What about that? Trying to understand a bit more, trying to pretend I broadly understood the concept, which of course I didn't. And I said to him, do you have any more ideas? And he said, um, oh, no, I've got loads. I was like, oh, yes, this is really exciting. So I said, well, can't tell me then, tell me. So he listed off four or five of these ideas. Oh, it's fantastic. And he said, yeah, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And I said, well, you've got it. You've got it. That's what we do. We invest. You know, we, we put money into business to make it better. We've got it. As an institution, is there anything that you found, you know, when you're trying to make these investments on decarbonisation? Have you anything, any pushback or any cultural things that you've had to overcome? Or has it been pretty plain sailing? No, no, no. It, it, there, there are always challenges. I, mean, I, I think, you know, we, we've got, um, I think by the end of this month, we'll be close to 100 people globally. You know, when we were 20 people, sharing ideas was so easy. It was just so easy. We were, we were closer together. We could um, discuss things. We could listen in. It was just so easy. Today, with you know, close to a hundred in, in the investment team, um, it's very easy to miss a good idea. So the first challenge is is sharing ideas. And actually, um, I've just had a discussion last night with one of my senior team about taking the lead on innovation. We've already got a couple of experts on ESG, but I want somebody to lead innovation because sharing those ideas can be really really valuable and, and it's not easy so that's the, the first hurdle is making sure you know what's going on so you can take the best ideas and, and, and use them across the portfolio um, the next bit is is resistance of course is because um, you get 
some management teams where everything's okay. We don't need to change. You know, we're the best in the sector. And then you have to say, well, let, can, can we prove that you're the best in the sector? Can we really look at this and find some examples? But you, you, you do get resistance. And in any business, you know, of course you can persuade, you can excite and energize and you know, make people want to do something, but there are competing, competing tensions for resources. Of course there are, you know, it's, it's, you know, there isn't money for everything at, at every time. So you do have to think very carefully about prioritizing. You do sometimes have to invest to enable um, and enabling investments quite often don't do much of a return, but you're paving the way for a good idea that's going to be ready in, in three, four, five years time. You have to keep your eye on current operational issues because they require cash and they happen. These are operating businesses and things go wrong. Niall, it's our absolute pleasure to support you and your portfolio companies on this journey. And thank you very much indeed for your time. That's a pleasure. Thank you, Claire.